Thank you. Thanks, so, Jamil. Hello. Venus, I see Venus is on. She made it. Jerome is here. I'm Jerome. Jerry. Jerry. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Pastor. Hey, Arlita. Hi, Reverend Nelson. Hey, hey Reverend. How are you? Good. Good. Well, You're taking a long time. Yes, it just long. Where's Donna? Let me take a moment. Let me take a got me over. Can they see us? See us. We can hear everything y'all saying. <laughs> well, <laughs> good, morning. good morning, Minister. Good morning, Janelle. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> Who is that? Sound like uh, Audrey, Audrey Kelly. Kelly. It's Audrey Kelly. Hi, Audrey. Hey, Audrey. Oh. Hi, Janelle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <That's laughs> Starting in two minutes. You're going to control the slides, right? Uh, yeah, I haven't opened those up. <coughs> they have the slides. If everybody checks, you have the slides as a handout. And thanks to Nicole, she tell, told me to make the uh, the waiting room a little more pleasant. I tried to set up a wall for you guys to review the things that you needed. Um, Don't mess it up. Okay, let me open up. Let's do Jerome. Mm -hmm. That's okay. What's today's date? 19th. Are we allowed to say good morning? It's awfully quiet. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Good morning. Great good open morning, Sammy. Pastor Nelson, my wife. Good morning, sir. Jamil's told me she heard you as well. Yep, she heard me. <laughs> there you are. There, I see you now. Uh -oh. <laughs> so you want your hair to go big? Do you need this right here? I think so. Yeah. You want this your hair? Push, push plus. Push plus. Push plus. Push plus. Push plus. Push plus. Push girl. That's good, right there. Okay. Hey, Denise. <laughs> Hey, Denise, Denise not speaking this morning. That's my sister. What's up, Brenda? No, no, no. Is that Brenda Hale? This is Who? I ain't had money get the paper get some. Okay, guys, the meeting, this is now officially 1101. We'll probably have some more guests come on um, just so that we'll get started. We've said all our hellos. I'm probably I'm gonna mute everybody now so you can't say hello anymore <laughs> because okay. I'm mute everybody. I got one more person coming in. Um, um, mute all. Yes. Now, you should only be able to hear myself or Denise. Denise, say, can you hear me? Okay, Denise, I guess I muted you too. Denise, unmute yourself. You went out? Let's see, it, you turn your volume up or something. I, we can't hear you. You're not muted. 
I don't know what happened. Denise is supposed to get us started. So let's try this. She's the co-host. Denise, I don't know what's going on with your audio. You might have to go sit at Leroy's iPad. <laughs> Now, can you hear me? We can hear you now. I'll make Leroy a, I'll make him a um, host. Okay. Okay. Wait a minute. Let me get Leroy and make him. Can you see me? Make him a co-host. Oh. We, can, we can see Leroy. We cannot see you. You see his face and not mine? Oh, he's sitting at your, at your. He's at my tab. So right. Yeah, I'm okay. So here. we're good. Uh, we have three more. We're up to 30 people right now. Okay, so um, hopefully everybody will monitor. But just to get started, so if you want to talk, uh, as I said in the chat room, try to use the chat box. I'm monitoring that, and that will give Denise enough time. If some questions come up, I will see them and can respond to them and let her know what's going on just in case her attention is drawn elsewhere. So without further ado, here's your today's instructor, Denise Little. Hello. Yeah, we hear you, Denise. Okay, I don't see anyone. Uh, you don't see anybody? I don't see anyone. Can you see me? No. We, Oh, I can, let me turn your video on. Let me see if I can turn it on for you. I'm on, Lee, I'm on Lee's iPad. And I think he had started your video. He, he didn't have it on. Okay. Okay. So. I see myself in the corner. Oh, I see. Okay. All righty. So you're a host and I will take Leroy off of being a host. Okay. All righty. No, Leroy is a host. Let me make sure. Okay. And Denise Little isn't a host any longer. Okay, go ahead. Okay, would you put up the, the screen, the um, agenda and all that, so I can get started, please? Sure. Hi, everybody. I want to start off with, on our agenda, um, it starts off that we have uh, a welcome, and so we've been welcoming everyone. So for the 30 plus members, and hopefully they grow to even more, welcome to our Sunday School lesson this morning. I want to start off with an opening prayer, so please close your eyes. Lord, we come to you right now. First of all, Lord, just acknowledging you as being our God, our King, Lord, that there's nobody like you, and no one can do the different things that you have done. And Lord, we just want to first of all say thanks. And now, Lord, as we do this virtual Sunday school, it's new to a whole lot of us, but, you know, you've given us the will and the way to do it. So bless us as we go through this Sunday school, those things that we need to get out of this lesson. We pray, Lord, that you uh, provide us with that wisdom. I pray now that you take me out of myself and use me as your vessel. This I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So I want to, if you have your books handy, I want you to keep your books handy. And now what I want to go to is um, read the, the aim for change. So you know what I want to start with first, Ar Arletha, is bring up slide number one where it has the picture of Esther. Today's story is about Queen Esther. Now, it is in chapter seven. But I'm going to have to be like I'm in school and I'm going to have to tell you everything that happens between chapter one before we get to chapter seven, because it's the entire story about what's going to happen today. First, looking at Esther, you can see that Esther is what the men would say she was fine. She was a pretty brown skinned woman. So think about a, a Erica Badu or think about a Tamron Hall, but she was a beautiful woman. And Esther was the queen. Uh, what we'll see later, she became the queen of King Xerxes. Next slide. Well, 
with this slide as it comes up, I want to kind of um, tell you the story. Well, I'm going to tell you the end before we get to it. So first of all, on your left-hand side, you see a picture of Queen Esther. This is when she was being appointed as being the queen. You see that she was a beautiful girl, had beautiful skin, pretty brown-eyed girl, and I forgot who made a song about pretty brown-eyed girl. But you can see that she was gorgeous. On the right, you see the picture of somebody else who's in this story, and he's the main character. And his name is Haman. So, so far I've introduced two main characters to you. Esther is on your left, and she's gonna become the queen for King Xerxes. And then you see on the right, we're gonna talk about how Haman ended up on this spick. At this time, you see before you keep in mind, and it's a scripture right there, so I'm gonna call on someone, and I'm going to ask Nicole to read that scripture, keep in mind. Okay, keep in mind. So they changed Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. Uh, okay, so now you have a third name. We already talked about Esther, who was going to be the queen. Haman, who we see is on that spick, and we're going to talk about how he became to be killed. And then they introduced the other main character, and his name is Mordecai. What you need to know right now is both Esther and Mordecai are Jews. And we're going to tell the story of how Esther became the queen and Mordecai ended up on the spick. Next slide. Where is the aim for change? Okay, let me admit two more people. Okay. What I do whenever I'm teaching is that it's a goal in mind for a lesson. Why us always know what the goal is for the lesson. For this lesson, the aim for change, I'm going to ask that Dot read the aim for change. In fact, yeah, Dot read that for me. She's muted. She can read. Uh -oh. Doc. I'll read it. Okay, yeah, her speakers. Do the, do the technical difficulties. So it says, by the end of the lesson, we will explicate the story of Esther as a triumph of justice. Explicate simply means we're going to make it clear. We're going to explain what happened to Esther. Secondly, it says that we're going to sense that treachery and wickedness will not win. Bottom line is if you do wrong to somebody else, it is going to come back to you. And the third goal is to act justly in every situation with the assurance that good triumphs over evil. And I can see the last word, so I'm gonna assume that oh, and it is evil. Okay, with that being said, let's get started. I wanna walk you through the story of Esther beginning with chapter one. Next slide, please. So in the background lesson and writing of Esther, and this is where I'm gonna to begin to walk you through it. In chapter one, we hear about the story of, uh, takes place in a country called Persia. And Persia basically was Babylon. There was a king there and his name was Xerxes. He was a very wealthy king. He believed in living large, he had, this big banquet party. And when he had the big banquet party, he invited everybody that was in all of his provinces. So think of King Xerxes and think of the state of Illinois, because I'd like to make an analogy that we can understand. Here we have uh, Pritzker, who is the governor of Illinois. But Illinois not only consists of Chicago, it, it consists of Rockford, Peoria, and you name it. So think of that King Xerxes had this big, vast amount of land that he oversaw. He gave a big party, and at his big party, he invited all the different mayors, so to speak, and all the different noblemen from across his entire uh, land that he oversaw. He gave a seven-day party, and at the party, he gave everybody their own gold goblet, and they could drink and eat the best of everything. 
he was also kind of a show off. So what he decided that he wanted to do is that he had a queen and her name was Besta. That was the queen at that time. He beckoned, showing off in front of all of his, you know, countrymen, and he said he wanted Besta to come to the banquet. Besta, being a sister, said, I'm not coming. He wants me to come for the wrong reason. So she decided, I am not coming to the banquet. Well, the king got angry. So what he did, because he was so embarrassed, he went to his friends, his noblemen, and he said, what can I do? What does the law say? Because she defied me and she did not come when I beckoned for her. And all of them were worried because they said, well, if Queen Bastai does that to you, what's going to happen when we go back home with our wives? If she can get away with it, then they'll get away with it. So what you need to do, King Xerxes, is that you need to banish uh, Queen Vestai. And that's what he did. That's basically what happens in chapter one. He decides, I'm going to banish uh, Queen Vestai, which means in chapter two, I need me a new wife. Now, now I'm going to chapter two. In chapter two, the king decided that I want the most beautiful woman in all the countryside to be my wife. Not only do I want her to be beautiful and fine, I also want her to be a virgin. So he sent word to everyone that he wanted all the prettiest women who were also virgins to come and be a part of his harem until he decided who was going to be his wife. Well, Mordecai, and remember I told you it's three main characters at this point. We talked about King Xerxes, now we're talking about Mordecai. Mordecai was also a Jew. And Mordecai heard that the king was looking for a new wife. Mordecai's uncle had a daughter whose name was Esther. Now let me introduce Esther. So because she was an orphan, her father had died, Mordecai raised her like she was his own child. Esther was beautiful. Everyone, when they behold Esther, said that she was just gorgeous. So he had Esther become one of the women in the harem that eventually King Xerxes was going to select from. When Esther joined, but also you need to understand, both Mordecai and Esther are Jews, and yet King Xerxes did not know that at this time. So when Esther came to join the harem, she had to wait until she was beckoned by the, the king. So one day, the king beckoned for Esther to come, and she went that evening, and the next morning, she left the harem, and she went back with the other women. During that time, she found favor with King Xerxes. So he decided in chapter two that Esther was going to be his new wife. So that's the end of chapter two, which brings me into chapter three. So before we get into chapter three, I want to give you a, a little bit more about uh, information about Mordecai, because now Mordecai is going to become more prevalent in this story. And after I tell you about Mordecai, I'm going to stop and see if you have any questions. Mordecai was a Jew. Mordecai also, uh, and at that time, it was a lot of Jews that were staying within uh, the reign of, of Persia, Babylon at that time. And those Jews basically had freedom. You know, when I read about the story, it reminded me of, uh, we have a lot of immigrants that are in this nation. And for a long time, they've been able to do and work many different jobs and become prosperous until, and here we're going to, to uh, Trump came in, and now Trump decides that there's too many immigrants within, Chicago, within uh, the land. So the Jews, for the most part, were able to go about, you know, a normal life, having homes and all like that, and nobody bothered them in Persia. Mordecai also, you know, had um, favor with the king, so to speak, and he was able to go around in the palace gardens and all like that. 
One day when he was around in the palace gardens, he heard two of the king's top men plotting to kill King Xerxes. When he heard about them plotting to kill the king, what he did is that he told his cousin, Esther, and Esther went and warned the king. Of course, when she went to warn the king, then the king had those two killed. But she did not tell the king at that time, it was Mordecai who had told her about the plot. So as we go into chapter three, I want to introduce to you again, Haman. Haman was the man that we saw at the beginning of the lesson that was on the spit. Haman was the right hand of the king. He was at that time noble, whatever the king wanted to do, he had done it. And he had found favor with the king so much so that the king listened to whatever Haman was saying to him. But the one thing that the king failed to understand is that Haman was an Amalekite and they hated the Jews. So in his quest to become even closer to the king, he also was telling the king, you know, we don't need to have these Jews here. You need to get rid of all the Jews. Again, talking about Trump saying now that he wants all the uh, Latinos out of, out of the country and stop them from coming in. So he had his ear and he was telling him over and over again, you know, I don't like, you know, you shouldn't like the Jews. We can run the country without them, so on and so forth. But um, he gained the king's favor. In doing so, the king kept giving honor and honor and honor to Haman. And Haman really was an evil person because he hated the Jews for no reason. He was from the, tri uh, I'm sorry, Mordecai was from the tribe of the ben Benjamites. And he had no reason to officially hate him, but he did. So what they decided to do with they being uh, Haman is that Haman said, whenever people see me, since I'm in such high honor with you and all like that, King, I want them to be to bow down before me. You know, you have these people that want you to kiss the, the ring. So that's what he wanted everyone to do. And the people in that country were doing it, all except for Mordecai. You're always going to have one. Sounds like uh, a few of us that's on here. I'm not kissing anybody's ring. So when Mordecai decided that he wasn't going to kiss the ring or he would not honor by bowing to Haman, then that was it. Haman was determined that he was going to get Mordecai. At this point, I'm going to, uh, I'm up to point to uh, chapter number three. I want to stop a minute and see if we have any questions. Uh, yeah, I have one question, Robert Redrick. Mm -hmm. uh, am I clear that uh, Esther is Mordecai's cousin? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Esther's, Esther's uncle, I mean, I'm, yeah, let me see. Um, Mordecai, Esther's father was Mordecai's uncle. Right, okay, so Esther and Mordecai are cousins. There you go. Got it. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Any other questions or any other comments? Now, as the plot thickens, we're going into chapter number four. So in chapter number four, when Mordecai, so uh, let me go back to the so, uh, <laughs> Something happened. I'm muted. So in chapter four, so in chapter four, uh, Mordecai found out that uh, Haman had this plot against all the Jews, and he convinced the king Xerxes that he should annihilate all of the Jews. I mean, men, women, children. He was just mean. And again, he did. It wasn't that Mordecai had done anything or the Jews had done anything. Sometimes people, and I'm gonna stop a minute. Sometimes, and we have to watch this. People would not like you and don't have any reason to like you. And that's what happened between Haman. Haman had no reason not to like Mordecai. He just didn't like him because he was a Jew. Something like us. Some people don't like us because we're black. 
Some people don't like us because we're Christian. And you probably had some relationships where they said, well, I like you, but I don't like your sister. You know, and so we have to be careful because we are people of God and we cannot afford to, God believes in love. And, that, and when I was reading this, do you know how much negativity comes from you not liking someone? It's too much energy. And that's what I tell people. Instead of you saying, I don't like that person and you go out your way to do something vile against them, it's better just to pray about it and move on. So let me come, go ahead and move on with this. Teach, Nisi, teach. <laughs> so anyway, we're in, uh, let me go ahead with chapter four with Mordecai. So Mordecai found out about uh, the plot with Haman and Haman had went to King Xerxes and Xerxes trusted him and he tricked King Xerxes into agreeing to kill all of the Jews. So Mordecai said, uh-uh, something has to be done. He know that he couldn't do anything, so the only thing he could do is go to his cousin, who was Esther. So when he went to his cousin, and this is the part I really want you all to think about, when he went to his cousin, Esther, Esther knew that even though she was the queen, I told you what King Xerxes had already done to Fashtai, the previous uh, queen. So the queen really didn't have any power. That was just his girl. So when Mordecai went to Esther, he said, you're going to have to go to the king for the plight of all your people, not only your people, but you, because you are, you are a Jew too. So when he says all Jews have to be killed, that means you too, Esther. Now on this, I want you to really think about it. What Esther decided to do is that she said, I'll go. But before I go, it's something that I want you to do. And she told Mordecai, I need you and the Jewish people to fast and pray. And I want you to fast and pray for three days and three nights. You couldn't drink anything and you couldn't eat anything. So I have a question that I want to throw out to you all this morning. Why did Esther tell Mordecai, before I go to him, I want you to fast and pray, you and the, and the other Jews as well? I want to throw that question out and see if I can get some kind of response. I got you, Minister Kenneth Kimbrough. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. OK. The fasting and praying, I believe, um, was for the reason of isolating yourselves to focus on God, uh, getting closer to God, spending time with God. And fasting also, you're not putting everything in your body. A lot of sweets, like or when we fast, uh, we have uh, certain instructions, no sodas, a lot of sweets. It's good when your body is, is pure and cleansed as best as possible when you're really seeking the Lord. And then um, praying, of course, we know that's be, to become closer to God, um, to try and get his attention as best as possible. And also fasting also bring humility. Uh, yeah. When we're seeking God, we need humility more than anything, humility and obedience. And then I'm quite sure it may, he may not come when we want him, but we will get an answer. Thank you. You know, that's so right. We have to be careful that, you know, Esther said, I'm going to do this. But, look, I better, I, first of all, I need some help. And my help has to come from God. She knew that she couldn't do it by herself. And so she wanted to be on one accord with her people. Kenny Kimbrough really put it in perspective. Kenny. And we need to remember when 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 I when I read this, we have to understand that in the Bible it says some things come by fasting and praying. And when you fast and pray, you're really petitioning God. And when we're petitioning him, we need to find out too, is this his will? Now Mordecai told her to do it, but she needs to know is this what God wanted her to do? Anybody else want to make any comments? Denise, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. This is Bob. 
Uh, she can hear you. Okay. One of the things I think happened is that when um, Esther was going to be the queen, she had gotten used to the pampering and, and all of the wonderful opportunities that were afforded her at the palace. I think one of the reasons she said fasting and praying was necessary because she needed to simplify what was going on in her life, focus on God, and realize that all of the things that she was experiencing in the palace were just temporary at that point. And she needed praying for herself and her people so she could actually realize where the real strength and power There you go. There you go. There you go. And that's what we have to realize. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, both you and Kenny. Uh, so now I'm going to move on to chapter five. So in chapter five, Esther knew that the law said that you could not enter into the king's chamber. You had to be beckoned by the chamber. But you know, we women, we have a way of uh, getting men's attention. Mm -hmm. So what she did is that instead of her being bold to go in, because that was certain what that was certainly going to be death. She just, you know, went and walked slowly back on the outside. And I'm sure she was looking good because I told you she was a pretty lady and everything. So, but she caught his attention. And when he saw her, then he beckoned for her to come. So when she came into his chamber, he said that she was looking good. So, you know, we, we, we know that we have to, I always tell people, ABC, always be cute. I just said, Put that in there but she was looking cute and everything so when she came in this chamber then uh the king asked her what is it that you want you know whatever you want i'm gonna give it to you just like that and she said okay king what i want is that i want you to come to my house and i want you to bring haman here we're talking about haman again he's back in the picture i want only you and haman to come to my house and i'm going to prepare a banquet for you so the king said, is that all you want? She said, right now, that's all I want. Again, she was uh, getting him ready for her big request. So he got Haman, and he told Haman, tomorrow we're going to go to the home of uh, my wife, and she's going to prepare a banquet for you. Now let's go turn to Haman. Now let's go back to Haman. I told you Haman was the right-hand man for King Xerxes. So Haman, with his pompous self, runs home and he tells his wife and his homies be very careful with what i'm gonna tell you now he goes home and he tells his wife i was back in the go with the king and we're going to the queen's house for dinner it's just going to be me and him me and him and so he said but you know what when i when the king told me that i looked outside and you know who i saw walking by in the palace outside was that mordecai so again even though he was getting ready to go to dinner with the king and with Esther, he was still focused with that hatred on Mordecai. Hate people can eat you away and can kill you. So then when he told his friends about, I still want to get rid of Mordecai, they told him, okay, why don't you build this big gallow? And what you'll do is that you're going to convince the, uh, when we get all the Jews, you can kill Mordecai and put him on the gallow. And so instead of his and this is what I wanted you to, to, to really pay attention to. We have to be careful on who we befriend. Many times when I get angry and I want to go off, I have to know who to call. I have to call the right person who knows Christ, who's going to tell me what Christ would want me to do. Preach it! Preach it! I have other friends that I'm going to call that if I want to have help me with the humbug, if I call them, they're going to urge me on. So we have to be careful as Christians. And you, you don't sit up here and just say, all oh, my friends have to be Christians, because if, if they all are, how are we going to turn other people to Christ? Amen. You know, so what you do is that, but you have to like, let your life so shine and you know, I can't, I can't think of this movie. Um, it's the movie where, and they've been playing it over and over and over and over. 
um, with, um, I can't think of it, but he was going out to revenge his friend's death. And somebody helped me with that movie. And he got in the car with them and they were going around to uh, uh, re uh, avenge his friends. What is it, Lee? Boys in the Hood. There you go. Boys in the Hood. Cuba Gooding got angry because uh, his friend got killed and he was going to go with all the rest of them to avenge the death. And what would have happened? He would have ended it up dead too. But because of the teaching of his father, he had sense enough. And even I believe uh, Ice Cube said, man, you don't want to have a part of this. So I'm saying you need to have friends who know that you are in Christ and who can tell you when you get ready to go down the wrong road, you don't want to do that because it's not worth it. So, and, and, and because of time, I want to keep going. So we're in, we're in a chapter five still. And I told you that Haman had went home and he was happy and everything because he was getting ready to go and have uh, dinner with the, with the uh, queen and with the king. So he did. He, uh, he built a gallow for Mordecai, but he also uh, went back with the king and the queen and he had dinner. When they went, had dinner that first night, and now we're in chapter six, when they had dinner that first night, the king asked Esther again, what is it that you want? And Esther said, what I want is for you to come back tomorrow night. So she invited Haman and the king to come back the next night. Since he departed early, then the king went back to his palace and uh, doing his kingly duties is what he did. He said he was reviewing everything that had happened around in the kingdom and he was reading his old journals. In his journals, he came across the story of Mordecai. And uh, it came to his recollection that Mordecai had really saved him from being killed by two of his guards, and he had never done anything to reward Mordecai. But you know who brought it back to his recollection? That was the Lord, because the Lord will bring back to us that that we need to remember. So when he brought it back to his recollection, hey, Ruben, hey, Vic. Uh, when he brought it back to his recollection, uh, then Haman came in and he said, Haman, did I do anything to reward the person that saved me? You know, and he didn't go into naming who it was. Haman thought that because he was so, well, he was so pompous. Haman thought that the Lord wanted to reward that, I'm sorry, that King Xerxes wants to reward him. So he was saying, so he asked him, he said, well, what do you think I should do, Haman, for this person that's been so good to me and da, 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 da. Haman thinking that he is for him. So he said, oh, well, give him a nice horse, give him a big royal robe. You need to let him have a parade and let all the people say uh, how great he is and all like this. And Haman said it up for him. He had no idea that this was for Mordecai. So he said, okay, then I'm gonna do all of that. So that's what the king decided that he was gonna do, but he was doing that for Mordecai. Now we go into chapter seven. So quick when question, chapter, Ms. Denise. Yes. Robert Reddy, quick question. This is all happening while the Jews are still in fasting and praying those three days. Is that correct? Yes, yes, okay. yeah, yeah. They're still in there three days. So then, uh, because she hadn't made her request yet, Esther. So now we're going to chapter seven, and this is the second dinner with Haman and King Xerxes and Esther, our three main characters. And that's where our lesson starts today. So now, Aretha, I want you to bring up the scripture, please, for, there you go, Esther's petition. And the first outline is uh, chapter seven, verses one through six. So if I can get a volunteer to read these six verses, again, this is where we're gonna start, where now it is the second and the last banquet that Esther has requested. And the participants are Esther, King Xerxes, and Haman, those three. Okay, who can read one through six for me, please? I can read, Denise. Thank you. So the king and Haman came to the banquet with Esther the queen. And the king said again unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. 
And what is thy request? And it shall be performed, even to the half of the kingdom. Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition, and my people at my request. For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then the king Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. Uh oh, Haman, now he got busted. Now, turn Aretha to the next slide, please. Thanks, Vicky. Yeah, We're not going to go to Hold on. in depth on Esther's petition. So this explains what we just what Vicky just read in verses one through six. Do I have a volunteer that would read this for everyone? Actually, Denise, remember, I think this is like four slides. Do you want them to read all four? I want them to read all four. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll read. Can you hear me? Thank yes, Corinne, go ahead. Esther's petition. Esther hosted two banquets and invited the king to bring Haman to each. Esther 7 records the events of the second banquet and Esther's hopes of pleading with the king to save the lives of her people in Mordecai. But it was not an easy task. Esther understood that she had minimal rights as a queen. The text does not mention the name of God. However, it assumes that in her fasting, it was God who had covered her as she prepared herself to ask the king her request. Esther was going up against not only the power of the king's decree, but also Haman, the most powerful noble in the land. Haman had a direct hatred against the Jew. Unfortunately, when he entered the banquet of the queen, did somebody, I thought somebody said something. Mm, go ahead. When he entered the bank, the queen, he was unaware of her identity as a Jewish woman. The king had already proclaimed that he was both willing to hear and approve her request, which is evidence that God had honored the prayers and fasting to provide her with favor from the king even before she made her request known. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Every time the king boldly states, what is your position? It will be given to you. Esther requests that the king save her people from annihilation and makes the case that if her people were sold into slavery, that she would have kept quiet. She emphasizes this is not because the Jewish people have offended the government, but because the hatred and prejudice of one man is the potential cause of their destruction. What strategy did Esther formulate in her approach to the king and how was that important in her achieving her outcome to save her people? Thank you, Corinne. Any comments on that question? I wanna, I wanna add something. Um, and this is something, you know, I always say, when I teach class that the Lord will give you the lesson that you need to hear and what is it in it for you. Um, Esther speaks about the injustice about the plot against her people. Uh, before she does that, she was wise enough that she asked for the people to go into a fasting and praying with her. But she also was wise enough, and this wisdom comes from God, and if we ask of him, it says in his word that he would give it to us liberally, that she had to know the right time to speak. Remember, she didn't ask that request the first when she had the first banquet. So she was still getting ready and listening, keyword, listening to God to know when I am going to speak. Secondly, I must know how to speak, and I want to have wisdom on what to say. So she needed to know what to say, how to say it, 
and the right time to say it. And we, in a lot of instances, because life is tough, sometimes we want to say some things, but we have to be prayerful and ask the Lord, and he will give you an opening. I found that out too, as, as much as, as you continue to live, that he will give you, and he will let you know when it is a time to be quiet and when it is a time to speak. So now let's wait. Six minutes remaining. Okay, and so we're getting to go into the last uh, four verses of this. So I need somebody to read seven through ten, and that takes us to the last of uh, chapter seven. Bavaria. I, I thought you said you were going to read very <laughs> we, I, she says she's, we can't see her here. She's, okay, can, can someone read, please? Deacon Webster here. No. Okay. You got me? Yes, we can hear you. And the king arising from the banquet of... You are reading. Oh, oh, the king, the king, then the king jumped to his feet in a rage and went out into the place garden, palace garden. Haman, however, stayed behind to plead for his life with Queen Esther, for he knew that the king intended. To... Can you hear me? Yeah. In despair, he fell on where the queen Esther was reciting, reclining. Just as the king was returning from the palace garden, the king explained, will he even exalt the queen right here in the palace before my very eyes? And as soon as the king spoke, he attended covered, he, his attendants covered Haman's face Signaling doom, signaling his doom. Then Harbana, one of the king's eunuchs, said, Haman has set up a sharpened pole that stands 75 feet tall in his own courtyard. He intended to use it to impale Mordecai, the man who saved the king from assassination. Then impale Haman on it, the king ordered. So they impaled, hold on, I'm blocked here. Haman on the pole, he had set up for Mordecai, and the king's anger was subsided. So I'm going to to end this right here, because I know Alita said a few minutes. So let me summarize what happened. <laughs> the king was so angry when Esther told him about the plot that was taking place that he stormed out. When he stormed out in his anger, Haman knew, uh-uh, I've been outed by Esther. So he went to talk to Esther to plead for his life. In pleading for his life to Esther, he fell on the couch. Well, that was a no-no. So when the king came back in, he thought he was trying to talk to his woman. So he got angry. So he said, not only have you sat up here and, and convinced me to, to do this to the Jews, but then when I leave out of my house, you're sitting on the couch with my queen. I want him killed. And so what they had done is that they took Haman and on the very gallows that he built, that spit that we saw in the beginning of the story, Ali, if you can go back up to that picture of the spit in the beginning of the story, that they would put a pig on. It was worse than a crucifixion. That's where they put Haman. So Haman is on that spit in his own house. It tells you, and I thought about it. You better dig too. Here, Haman wanted to kill, but instead of him being killed, then he ended up on a spit that he had intended for somebody else. With that being said, we as Christians, and bringing this to a close. We are God's people. Esther gave us some good lessons in here. She told us that whatever we do, we need to petition and see if it's the will of God. And in petitioning for his will, we also ask for wisdom. We also need to know that we have a responsibility also as Christians to speak against injustice. Now, can you just say anything, you know, if, if you see somebody being unfair, I always say silence means it's okay. If you see somebody that's not treating somebody fairly, you should say something. 
It may not be at that time when they're doing it, but God will provide an opening for you to come and tell that person, you know that wasn't right. And I always say that you need to speak to people when they will hear you. So I want to thank everyone who participated. Thank you, all my readers. Um, thank you for everybody that tuned in. This has been a learning experience for me as well with this technology. And now I just think about what they're going through at Chicago Public Schools. And I just want in ending this, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Arlita, but I want to say one thing. I want us to pray for our children uh, who will not have five months of learning. I mean, that's heavy on my heart. And for us with children and with grandchildren and with friends and everything, just pray for our children um, as we go through this season. Okay. Denise, Denise, can yes. I say something? Uh -huh. um, it was a great lesson. But one of the things that I, that I keep in mind with this, Esther was somebody who uh, would be like not privileged, mm -hmm. but her gift mm -hmm. made room for her. All right, all right. No matter where you are in life, if you're doing what God has called you to do, mm -hmm. you'll gift will make room. make room and all of us have a gift that's, that's it right. that's everybody right. <laughs> everybody has worth everybody has value and we need each other to survive Sarah, i have you on the line what and i just put up the invitation will you please present the invitation to christ for us please me yeah it's on the screen oh. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I have to follow this instructions here, okay. Uh, one of the things is, is that through this lesson that we find out, number one, is that we need Jesus. And yes, we need to know him as our personal savior. So there are three ways that you can come and, and, and join the church uh, under watch care uh, by your Christian experience or as a candidate for baptism. Now, if you're coming as a candidate for baptism, that means you have never confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And this is an opportunity for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. It's a promise. So if you would like to come and join with us, and uh, be a member of our church, or if you would like to be baptized and accept him, now is your time, now is your hour. Confess, believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he died and that he rose again on the third day with all power of heaven and earth in his hand. God bless you. We pray you come back again and tell somebody else that Jesus is alive at Greater Open Door Missionary Baptist Church. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, everybody. We appreciate everybody who participated. We now have about 10 minutes left before we can go on and see the pastor's sermon. It's a great one. We'll see you again, hopefully next week. Thank you, Denise, for such a great job. Bye-bye. Uh-oh. Pastor? Well, you put thank you. Pastor? I just said thank you. Great job. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> See you next Sunday. Bye -bye. Great job, Denise. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.